Well, hello everyone. There's that Williams guy joining us. Uh, I think for episode number three that he has been with us, uh, Mr. Shane Gosa. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine, Lee. How about you? I am doing well. And for the audience, Shane is someone that I enjoy tormenting almost as much as I enjoy tormenting John Hearn. I like to torment Hearn too. I think it's like an official right. sport. It is. It has its own turn. It's called Herning. Yes. I'll, yes. Sometimes, I'll write sometimes that down we, of it. Yeah, there you go. And I do appreciate your assistance in herning her from time to time. It's the best job in the world. <laughs> you know, only a select few, which means everybody is is called to do it. Yes, sir. It is a All calling. Right. It is a calling. All right. Uh Shane, you've been on several times before, but it's been a while. So just give a brief rundown of who you are. Uh, my name is Shane Gosa, like Lee said, and I've been a post-certified peace officer in Georgia for 24, 25 years, somewhere in that. I think Lee's got me beat by one year. So whatever Lee says, it's one year less than him. Um, you know, it's just uh, do that. I teach for my agency. Uh, I do sales as another job. I've got a few other jobs as well on top of that. Uh, still on the board for the Georgia Association of Law Enforcement Firearms Instructors. Uh, do a little writing, do a little teaching for them. And uh, other than that, just trying to live up to your uh, expectations. <laughs> you know, and you spent a good bit of time with uh, Colonel Cooper's young man, did you not? I did, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, last week's episode was all about the basically the just pure nonsense out there and the disrespect uh, that is being paid towards, you know, one of our, our more venerable people in the business, and that was Mr. Ken Hackathorn. And you brought up a very interesting topic that we would like to get into tonight, and that is having respect for the past and the history of our of our art while still being adaptable and learning and i know you wanted to start off with a story so go right ahead so one of the things that got me thinking about the whole situation that's going on right now that we're talking about was years ago i think it was 2001 i went to the nti uh john farnham was assigned as my partner and i met a lot of uh met a lot of people out there that I stay in contact with today that I went through training classes with, and it was a overall really uh, good experience for me. Uh, during the NTI, they had some symposium speakers and uh, Greg Hamilton and John Holshen were at insights together at the time. And they were two of the main speakers. And so I got to listening to them. I said, you know what? I might want to go, take a class with these guys. So they came to Georgia maybe a year later, maybe the same year, later that year, the very next year. They came to Georgia and they taught two classes. One was a folding knife class, a defensive folding knife. And the other was a intensive pistol skills class. Now, for those that haven't been around the training community uh, for a very long time, Back in the 90s and early 2000s, there were a handful of trainers that were uh, pushing a evolution of the art, so might you speak. So, you know, before then, we, we basically had as main places to draw from learning and skills, Jeff Cooper and Gunsight, Ray Chapman, Masada Ube, and Chuck Taylor and a few other schools like that. Mid-South uh, was, was primarily devoted to military and law enforcement special operation, but you had very few in the private community that were pushing anything that did not come out of uh, Jeff Cooper and Gunsight. So I was a, as you had mentioned, I had spent a good time, of, a bit of time with Jeff Cooper. And so I was very hard Weaver shooter, 1911, 45, uh, leather holster. And uh, so I went to this course and Greg and John 
were co-teaching the class. It was up in, I think, South River Gun Club outside of Atlanta. And the base of this course was to transition people over to the isosceles platform and some newer techniques. And at the time it was called, and I think Andy Stanford, who was one of the other instructors that was teaching this, this style program at the time, I think he coined it surgical speed shooting. Yeah. And uh, basically it was a throw you in the deep end, abbreviated, um, just immersion into the isosceles platform, some different uh, target to target transitions, different draw style, uh, as well as different guns, different holsters and stuff. So I, I show up there with a 1911 and a uh, Kramer leather outside the waistband holster shooting uh, from a hard uh, weaver stance, you know. And at the time, uh, John was shooting a SIG 228. And he was using a Kramer holster. I think his was an inside the waistband. And then uh, Greg was shooting a Glock 19. And I'm pretty sure that was a Kramer inside the waistband too. They were shooting from the isosceles stance. And John had some teaching points back and forth about why they were improvements um, or perceived performance enhancements over the Weaver and so on and so forth. Uh, and I fought that class the entire time. I looked to find every kind of reason I could why it was wrong as opposed to what all of my previous training had been because I was comfortable with a certain stance or platform. I was comfortable with a certain equipment and I had a lot of money and time and emotional investment in my platform. And so I fought with everything I had to find out why that was not something that would actually work, why it was just a competition technique or something like that. Well, over the years, uh, I listened to what they had to say in the class. I just completely disregarded it. Um, over the years, I ended up going to work for a guy um, that owned another training company that's uh, Mario Martinez. He's passed away now. Uh, he was commander of Hillsborough's ERT unit and uh, did a bunch of other stuff with the feds. And uh, he's a legend in the, the special operations community. But uh, when I went to work for Mario, one of the first things he told me was, if you're going to work for me, you've got to carry the gear that I carry and you've got to teach the system that I teach. You know, so he saw a skill as far as my performance and he saw an ability as far to impart knowledge. But he wanted me using what he taught, which is what he thought was the best system there was. And that did involve the isosceles involved a. Uh, high capacity striker fired modern pistol, you know? And so I worked on that, worked on that. And I found that I had to uh, not work so hard on it uh, to transition, but I had to work to immerse myself in it, to be able to under stress go to that as opposed to what I'd previously been trained in. Years later, um, I saw John Holchin at I don't know if it was a conference or what. It might have actually been a class that I came back and took from him later. And I told him that I apologized to him because at the time I took the class, uh, I was I was younger. I, I'm still arrogant. Uh, I won't say that I was less arrogant, uh, but I was younger and not as wise or knowledgeable. And I said, you know, I fought that everything you said. I said, I paid money. I didn't care because it was the, the amount of the class and travel just wasn't anything to me. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything to bother me with financially. So uh, the time wise, that wasn't anything either. But I, I said, you know, I came up there to your class and I wanted to fight it because it was different. And I wish I would have listened to you. And I wish I would have at least given you the respect to try what you were talking about. And you were right on a lot of the points that you were teaching. And I would be a lot further along uh, had I had an open mind and had I listened to you and not fought it. And John's a prince in the training community. If you, I mean, I know he's been on your show before, but um, he, he defines uh, the quiet professional. You know, he's a Green Beret and, and that's what they're known as. And he defines that. Uh, in fact, I think they first started saying that about him. 
Uh, but he was very gracious and uh, he wasn't arrogant. He didn't smirk. He said, well, that's no problem. He said, we've all been there and I'm glad it could help you. And, you know, I, I have tremendous respect to the man to this day. But the point of it was that we all have ego. We all have emotional investment in certain things. And so we do our research and we look if we're going to spend money or time doing something and we invest that into it. So we latch on to it at even a subconscious level. And we don't, if we make progress with it, if we become good at it, if we become comfortable with it, uh, we don't like to let that go. And so sometimes we get so much wrapped up into this system of beliefs or um, something to fall back on, sir. And gear choices. Gear choices, yes, sir, that we get wrapped around it and we let it define us, you know. And someone on one of the Gunsight alumni groups posted recently a comment from Cooper's Commentaries where Jeff Cooper was talking about the Isosceles versus the Weaver. And he said, either will serve you well. I wish the argument would just go away because it's silly. Now I'm paraphrasing and he said it much more mm -hmm. eloquently and without an accent than I did. Um, but, you know, I, I've mentioned that before. Jeff Cooper had a way of doing things and he thought that his way was superior or there was a reason to do it. But he didn't just say it's the only way. You know, he was not as dogmatic as people say. Doctrine was his baby, but it was not dogma. Um, but we, we've watched um, lots of people, um, myself included, uh, that will take and get wrapped around one particular way of doing something almost as cultish, you know, and we have to defend this or we have to defend that. And if someone's not part of our pack, we're going to jump on it. Um, so I know Ken, um, I've taken several classes from him. In fact, the first class that I took from him, Jeff Cooper had already uh, passed away. And to, to talk about how arrogant and how set I was on certain things. I showed up in a M series BMW with a six thousand eight hundred dollar nineteen eleven that was seracoded to match the paint on my BMW, and an elephant and alligator hide trimmed duty rig. You know, that's just a normal day for me. And uh, I was like, Ken Hackborn, this is going to be great. You know, he's a legend. And I was like, this 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 guy's got good information. He's a good teacher, but he's kind of a normal guy. You know, it's great. So um, at a break, I said, when was the last time you talked to Mrs. Cooper? And he looked and said, the Countess? And I said, yeah, he said, it's been a while. And so I pulled my phone out and I called her. And uh, I said, Mrs. Cooper, I've got somebody here that wants to talk to you. And he said, hello, Janelle. And uh, right away, she said, hey, Ken. You know, and they talked for a few minutes. And he said, how do you know her? And I told him, and then the next two hours were Jeff Cooper stories from his time at Gunsight, you know, which was worth about 10 times the admission of the class. Um, so he's, he's been around a long time and, um, you know, he was a Green Beret and he was one of the first, first instructors at Gunsight. He was involved and I believe he hosted the Columbia conference to start Ipsy. Uh, if not, it was close to his home range. And uh, one of the founders of IDPA and, you know, he held contracts to train um, Army Special Operations, federal law enforcement, tier one units, and uh, invented a lot of the techniques, invented a lot of the drills, um, and has had input in creating all sorts of things. He had input in creating the 416, he had input in, in creating the HK-45. Um, you know, he talked for, I, I believe he talked for Crimson Trace. He was big on lasers at the time. And he's he's open to new ideas. And yes, he's old. And yes, he uh, he carries a 1911 strong side, you know. Um, but Ken has not just stagnated 
his opinion comes from teaching tens of thousands of very high level shooters that will actually use their guns. Uh, from seeing millions of rounds of ammunition go down range and from seeing what's worked and what hasn't. And uh, he's not fallible by any means. He's just a human being. Uh, but I respect what he says, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, Moss Ayub, uh, who's also on that channel that people are upset at about something or another. I'm not sure what at, but I've, I've been in the exact polar opposite camp of him. You know, he was like the anti-gun site for the longest time with what he taught and uh, everything else. Not saying it was wrong, just saying it's the polar opposite, right? So I enjoyed reading some of his articles and I enjoyed reading some of his books, but I didn't pay much attention to them because that was different from what I believed in or what I was used to. Over time... I've come to find out Moss has a lot to offer and he's got a lot of wisdom. And uh, it's one of those things where you look at it and you can disagree, do so respectfully, and then go live your life. Because we've got everybody in the gun culture. I mean, everybody outside of the gun culture doesn't like the gun culture. So we're having to fight them. But now we're fighting amongst ourselves over stupid things. And uh, it just it kind of it kind of worries me uh, because I I, it used to be, you know, you go to a class, you go to a range, people do anything in the world for you. Some of the best people I've ever met have been at classes or matches or something like that. Give you the shirt off their back. Good, hardworking people, honest, uh, fun to be around and come from all walks of life. And I don't know if it's the, the society we live in now or the way that people have been raised in the last generation or two, but it's just, it's, I wish people would be more accepting if that makes sense. Yeah. I think what we've got going on, and this is, I'm sure this applies to other interests. It's not just gun stuff. Uh, this is just the world we all walk in. If you're listening to the show, watching it. Yeah. I, I think what we have going on is people want to basically claim ownership of expert status long before they have actually achieved expert status. And I'm using the expert more like the legal definition of expert. It's just they have a little bit of experience. They've gone to a few classes. And they think that puts them on par with people that have done this for decades and have trained thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And occasionally I'll get involved in, in a conversation back and forth with someone in one of the various groups or whatever about why we do certain things. Oh, no, no, I've, I've never seen that in my class and I've been teaching for three years. Okay, well, I've seen it and I've been teaching for X number of years. Or I, or I know of documented instances where it happened or other places. And yeah, I just don't think there's as much credence that should, pay, that should be paid to the people who paved our way. And I'm also reminded of an instance where a very well-known instructor uh, was putting together a video series and he reached out asking like several people to review the videos. And he was going to send them a copy of this. Sure, I'd like to do that. And I've never taken a class from this person. But I got a copy of one of the videos and I watched it. And like in the first 10 minutes, I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. That's right. This, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This is it. But I kept watching. And later in the video, I saw something that, oh, wow, I need to go test that. I need to go try that. And it turned out it was, that was pretty well on. And if I had just shut him down at the first time I disagreed with him, I never would have gotten to the point that benefited me. And, you know, we can look at like some, any instructor's opinion on something. I disagree with your opinion on that. 
So therefore, nothing else they have to say has value. I just don't understand that. It um, it's it's what what you're saying. I believe is you know we we've, we've got to we've got to look at it different, um, and it takes time. You know, um, to quote um, one of your and mine mutual friends, Stephen Seagal. You know, what does it take to change the essence of a man? It takes time, right? And I think that takes time um, with... For the audience out there, I don't know Stephen Seagal. He's not a friend. Please don't reach out. Oh, can you... No, I don't know. So, I, I, it, it, well, I'm, I'm concerned now because you'll claim Hearn, but you won't claim Stephen. I actually know Hearn. Okay, just checking. All right. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, it takes it takes time to to change people, and we're so it, we're so we've talked about this before. You know, I used to go to the store and buy a magazine and read the magazine, and then I would tear out some of the magazine and I would write with a pen, an actual ink pen, and then put a stamp on an envelope and mail it. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I'd wait until it came back. Um, people don't have to do that now, you know, you, you want a holster or a gun or a book or clothes or whatever you go online and you order the stuff, you know, with the exception of the gun, everything just shows up at your house. The gun still gets there within a few days and you just go to your local federal firearms license dealer and fill out the paperwork. Um, I bought one last week and it's online. You know, you got to go type everything in online. And I remember hand filling out paper 4473s, but they don't do that anymore, you know, at least in some places. But that's that's where mm -hmm. it's moving to. Everything's instant gratification, you know. Um, and with that instant gratification, with YouTube, with all these platforms, you're getting information a lot quicker than you used to. You know, you wanted to... Um, you wanted to go to take an actual class, you'd have to set a week aside and fly or drive across the country to take that class. Then they started having traveling guys. You know, Jeff Cooper was one of the first traveling instructors. John Farnham was one of the first uh, traveling private firearms instructors. Um, but You'd have to, you know, now now you can get online, you can tap a few buttons and find anything you want to on YouTube or one of these other social platforms. And everybody on there has a following to a degree, right? Whether whether they're presenting good information or bad information uh, is very cliquish. Uh, it's what looks cool. You know, the Instagram models. Uh, Got to take this shot for the gram, you know, and the thing about most uh, of this is it's not done in real time. So and I'm not calling anybody specifically. I'm not targeting anyone. But that tape that you saw may have been someone doing it 20 times to get just the right take, you know, going back to hack. He'll show what I got is what I got. I'm taking it one time. You know, I'll take the score I got. It's what I earned. And uh, did you just throw balloons up on the screen? I have no idea what just happened, but balloons just flew across the screen. It's Hearn. He's hacked the uh, computer. It could be. But, um, you know, not everybody has the has the integrity to do that. So you don't know what's real and what's not. We're in a digital age, you know. And we're in an instant gratification age. So one of the reasons I think that the dots are popular is because they're, and I hesitate to say that, well, they can't cancel me because I'm not well known enough and I don't care. So, but it's a gadget, right? Uh, not saying that it's not a good gadget, um, but it's a gadget nonetheless, right? So it's electronic and it fits better in the current age of digitalization. Jeff Cooper put out a call to all of the faithful at one time when he was sending out his newsletter to his list of, of the gun site family. 
And he wanted someone to explain what digital was to him. And no one could explain what digital meant to his satisfaction. And he kind of gathered that it just meant newer. They're the balloons again. I don't it, understand it, what, what's what's going on with that. I like the balloons. I'm sorry. They look cool. I, I think you're doing it. I'm not I'm not doing it. <laughs> um but um uh, you know he he figured out it, it meant better and newer or better because it was newer and more expensive. You know, he he could not wrap his head around what digital meant. And to give credit where credit's due, I'm not sure that anybody can give a sad uh uh, satisfactory answer to it but um you know pistol mounted optics they aren't new and i hate to i hate to burst certain people's bubble uh, you know we've talked about it the first time a optic like that was used was in the santoy ray back in the 60s you know and then throughout the 80s maybe even before that you had them on ipsic guns but the first person to actually put them on a combat-oriented handgun, the first person to put them on a pistol for the express, express purpose of offense or defense was Kelly McCann. Uh, Kelly did that in the late 90s, milled a Glock 19 uh, for a doctor optic, and he had reasons for it. And uh, some people claim that they, they did this, they did that. Again, credit where credit's due. You, you aren't going to, many people aren't going to hear about Kelly. You know, he's kept quiet. He served the uh, government. He's done a lot of private stuff for the government as well. Um, he teaches still now, but you're, it's not a name you're going to see a lot of places, but he was one of these guys that did a lot of first. Um, so I was exposed to them uh, in the early, early 2000s, around 2000, 2002 time frame from the work that he had done. And uh, I had a guy that I shot with that had one. I shot with uh, this guy with uh, with a red dot on a Glock 17. And we didn't have really any training with them and we didn't want to figure them out enough. They were a, they were a gadget for, for games, right? They were a gun, gun game gadget. So nobody made any beauty holsters. You, you could have got, I mean, you could get a blade tech with a special thumb break, you know, retention on them, but that was about it. Those were the options. Then um, they died until the later 2000s, around 2008, 2009 timeframe. And they started popping up on certain special operation stuff. And then some parts of the private sector, and they kept on and they kept on and they kept on. And then one of the major firearms manufacturers started selling guns with the optics on it from the factory. And it kind of took off and it's ballooned in the last two, three years. And I see, uh, I see agencies all over the place. They don't want the gun without the optic. You know, uh, they just don't want it. They have to have the optic on there. And you talk to some agencies that are are not they're buying the new guns without optics but they want the optic cut because they're eventually going to put the optic on there uh one of the largest agencies in the state of georgia uh which is a state agency uh has 1800 people and they bought brand new guns every last one of them has a hollison 509t and uh, Streamlight TLR7, and they're using U.S. duty gear holsters for them. And I was in a class with some of the uh, instructor cadre that were going through trying to figure out how to use them, developing all their plans and stuff. One of the reasons they bought them is for retention, because all of these newer uh, officers, agents, uh, are expecting the latest and greatest mm -hmm. gear. And so if they don't have it, they'll go somewhere else, you know, or they may get their foot in the door. Go ahead. I want to interject there because I remember a time with NDTs review of patrol cars. And I know officers that changed agencies specifically so they could go to work somewhere that had NDTs in the course. Which is a mobile data terminal, which is basically yes. a computer um, right. for people that don't know. Right. Well, we don't have to hand write our reports over here. We do them on these these computers in the cars. 
And, you know, if you got year or two in with an agency or whatever, it's not that big a deal to start over and lose all your retirement and everything. But like for this old dog like me and me, you know, changing for something like that now just seems kind of really, really, really stupid. After the, uh, I think it was around 2018, 2019, after the 3,742nd time that we had to get people to come in for overtime to do data reentry because the cloud crashed, uh, yeah. I recommend we would go back to handwriting reports. And I was almost burned at the stake for it, you know. <laughs> And uh, half of the agency said, what do you mean handwrite? How do you handwrite a report? They had yeah. no clue. You know, we got, uh, I hadn't worked patrol in forever. And uh, I went in one weekend to work a shift. And I pulled someone over for doing 60 in a 35. And uh, I go to handwrite the ticket. And one of the, one of the guys that normally works patrol shows up. And he sees me standing outside behind the vehicle writing a ticket. And he says, what are you doing? I said, writing a ticket. And he said, what is that? And I said, it's a ticket book. You know, he said, where'd you get that? I said, well, I've had it forever. You know, and he said, we don't do that. I said, well, how long haven't we done these? Like five or six years, you know, at least. He said, longer than I've been here. He said, watch this. You have the license. So we go back to his car. And he proceeds to put his license in this little machine and it auto populates everything onto the citation. He's like, use the drop down mirror or uh, thing. And then he says, OK, do you have the tag number? I said, yeah. So he proceeds to run the tag and the license from the stroke of a few buttons. And it comes back. Everything's good. And he presses a button and it prints it out, you know, and I'm like, what is this? You know, this we're, we're living in the future. <laughs> Yeah. And but I'm not used to it. But you, you look at the the newer officers, they they've got to have and that's not a knock on them, you know, because right. when when I came on, you know, I wanted a uh, I wanted uh, certain equipment. You know, I thought that the 6280 by Safari Land was the hot thing, you know. Okay. And so you either before then had a thumb break or a 070 SS3, which I've still got one you gave me for a commander. You know, but if, if you wanted to be a gunfighter, if you wanted to not die on the street, you need to get rid of all that. And you need to go to the SLS system because that was what you needed, you know, um, and that's sarcasm for the people listening that can't. Well, you couldn't tell by my expression anyway, but, um, you know, so you, you just kind of want things. And some of the older guys are looking like, well, you don't need those because I never did. You know, the guy, you, you go tell Jelly Bryce and Bill Jordan that they needed a 1911 to win a gunfight. They'd look at you like you're crazy. You know, you go uh, tell Jeff Cooper you need a high capacity nine millimeter uh, to survive on the streets. And he just kind of look at you and not even reply. He just writes you off, you know. Um, so some people now saying that you have to have a pistol mounted optic or you have to have this. There are certain people that just are going to look at you like you're crazy because that doesn't match up their experience. And that doesn't mean these new guys are wrong. It, it absolutely doesn't. Uh, but everything's a two-edged sword, has its, uh, has its uh, pros and cons. Uh, Weapon-mounted lights. So, you know, Ken had made a comment about um, why I basically why would the way I took it was why would you carry one for the added weight and bulk unless you were mm -hmm. in uniform? It's not needed, you know. Right. Have you you listen, sir? I was agreeing. Oh, and you you listen to Tom Gibbons and take his classes and look at the staggering amount of students he's had win. Usually when somebody's trying to assault a private citizen, they have to be able to see them to get close enough to rob them or rape them or assault them or whatever they're going to do. Right. So do you need a flashlight in that situation? Probably not. You know, uh, does a police officer need one? Probably so. But also the police officer, uh, and I say probably, and I'll quantify that, but you know, they, they don't know where they're going. They're going to get dispatched to dark buildings in the daylight. They're going to get dispatched to the middle of the country with no street lights around. 
Um, they're going to go into places that the average citizen is not going to be morally, ethically, or legally required to do. So, you know, for years, I ran a handheld light, and I have cleared structures and confined areas with a handheld 1911 or a flat uh, 1911 and a handheld light. Uh, I've done the same with a, a Glock and a weapon mounted light. I'd rather have the Glock and the weapon mounted light when I go into somewhere that I know someone specifically is that the intel shows, hey, that's the only person in there. They're the bad guy, you know, or only threats are in that area. Uh, I'd rather clear that with a weapon mounted light than I would a handheld. And as far as the the pointing of, you know, never let the muzzle cover anything you're not fully willing to destroy. There are techniques I have that um, and have been taught that I can use a weapon mounted light to search with without violating that specific rule, but they're specialized techniques and they take time. So it's a lot easier to search with a handheld light, especially if you're in your house and your child or your spouse is down the hallway. You know, uh, that doesn't mean don't have a weapon mounted light on your your bedside gun. That just means consider the pros and cons. And you might want to search with the handheld and you can just simply drop it if you do have to shoot. Um, the only time now that I would carry a weapon mounted light if I was not on duty is if I was working a high threat not a PSD, but a high threat individual uh, EP job where I knew that there was a specific person that I was protecting that had specific threats against them. You know, I'd want a weapon mounted light at that point because I don't know if I'm going to have to fight my way into or out of a structure. And I've got someone I'm responsible for. So the argument then becomes, well, I'm, I'm the, the bodyguard for my family. I got it. I, I'm not arguing with that at all. And if you want to carry a weapon mounted light and you want to add the bulk and everything else, go ahead. You know, I'm just, I'm kind of on Ken's side with, I don't know that you actually need it. And I personally don't want to carry the bulk, but if you want to go ahead, you know, um, pistol mounted optics, you know, you, uh, you gave it analytical thought, you know, you wanted to take, this class and then you want to take a different style class and you want to take force on force and you wanted to do um shooting at night with it and in adverse lighting condition you wanted to check all the boxes because you'd had so much time and training on iron sights and everything else that if this is a piece of critical life-saving equipment if we're going to add it to the gun, we need to be able to function with it under all sorts of conditions. You know, can I function up to the standard that I did previously with iron sights? And that's not wrong at all. That's a wonderful idea. But what I see is people thinking that they just have to have it or they're going to die. Or I've got to switch over and then because you've invested um, whatever, whether you went and bought a new gun, whether you milled the old gun, uh, then you invest in the optic and you invest in the holsters. You go out and you don't quite get the results that you did before. People still cling on to that because they put all that money and effort into it. And, oh, well, I'll get better. When in the middle of a gunfight, you know, the best way to do it is to keep what you got and then practice with the other until you become that proficient in it. You know, but that takes time and money. And I think a lot of the people think that all of this applies to everybody. And it doesn't. Most people aren't going to be going to the range every month, let alone week. You know, some the average person that owns a gun may or may not take a class past their concealed carry permit class. If that's what their state requires. You know, the average police officer is not going to the range more than their agency requires them to go, whether that's once a, once a month or once a year, you know, and you can't, you can't build, you can't, you can't have driven an automatic car 
for your entire life or 10, five years, 10 years, and then be given an hour long or a day long class or a two day class on how to drive a manual and then get put on I-75 in downtown Atlanta at rush hour and not stall that car, you know, every time because you forget the, the clutch. Um, so it, uh, I'm, I'm not for or against diets. If you want it, great. If you don't, fine. I don't care. I don't think you need one, but also I'm not you, right? So your situation and circumstances may dictate that uh, that works for you, whether failing eye, eyesight or whatnot. I think the advantage of them is moving target at night in low light. I think that's where they outshine iron sights. Um, precision shots at distance and then body shots at greater distance. Absolutely. They're quicker. You know, once you've got the proper training on Carl Wren did a study some years ago and basically he said timer and paper results on target that to 10 yards, he didn't see a real difference in the iron sights or the optic. Um, so I'm always, I'm always trying everything out. And, uh, I went to the range today working on a new course of fire and a friend of mine, um, big Dick, you know, Dick, um, he, uh, he and I went out there today and I use him a lot as kind of my litmus test, you know, because he's got, he's got some very good training and he practices but and dick is above the average shooter but he's not like tier one level you know oh. so he's a he's a good he's a good benchmark now he can do more than the average shooter but he's he's still a good benchmark for me and so we went out and we shot today and he shot it with a uh, a classic sig 226 with iron sights out of an ALS holster. And I shot it uh, with a Shadow Systems XR920 with iron sights from a Kramer inside the waistband under a closed front shirt. And so I shot it first, then he shot it. Then I came back and I shot it with a 365 with a Hollison on it uh, from under a uh, same thing, under a closed front cover garment shirt. And what I found out was that I was slightly tenth of a tenth of a second, uh, two tenths of a second quicker um, sometimes from seven yards and in with the iron sights. But it was about even. Once I got to 10 yards, I was half a second to two seconds, depending on the drill, quicker with the dot than I was the iron sights which leads us into is it practical and is it probable you know so what are we getting are we are we trying that 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 low probability are we are we spending our time mm -hmm. and and money and effort on focusing for something that may happen but it's not probable when we should be practicing other skills like slide lock reloads. I don't, I, I, you should know how to do them, but you should go also take a range master class and learn how to do an in battery speed load at the end of your, your drill or a reload with retention. And you should get really good at those over the low probability of having to do a slide lock reload in a keyboard fantasy running gunfight. You know, um, I was in Katrina within a few days of landfall and there were running gun battles in Katrina, but there were also not running gun battles in Katrina. It just depends on who was doing what and what part of the city it was. And I haven't seen the likes of Katrina hit again. You know, not that they won't, but how often is that going to happen? And is it going to happen in your lifetime? We didn't see running gun battles in Atlanta during the riots, you know. Um, 
So it's, it's one of those things where, what are we doing probability wise? And I am all for anyone that wants to equip themselves with the most advantage they can possibly get 100%. But what are the, what's the whole picture, you know, and from looking at, you know, the, the video with Ken, he's got, um, at least six guns that have red dots and he's got 20, 30,000 rounds through them. And I can guarantee you, he's not out there shooting at beer cans. You know, he's running actual qualification courses with them. Uh, he's running actual scenarios with them. And all he's saying is there, there are some deficiencies, but again, you know, their deficiencies with people shooting iron sights and some guy named Jeff Cooper figured that out a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I have not on my duty gun on my actual, uh, gun I do carry at work. Um, I do have a, uh, weapon mounted light and I do have an optic, right? So, and it is a high capacity, uh, nine millimeter modern striker fired design but it's, it's so modern it'll even shoot on its own the uh that's incorrect that is incorrect um <laughs> he, I'm, he trying, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be uh i'm trying to be professional here <laughs> uh but you know not working not in uniform um it has been for a, a good long while a lightweight uh, officer's model frame commander slide. Uh, now I've got some problems with my back and my neck for uh, carrying me for so long, as do you. But um, it got sorry, you actually, you broke up there for a second. I said, I've got some problems with my neck and my back from carrying mm -hmm. the weight of John Hearn on me and the tactical community, as do you and everyone else. Yeah. But um, you know, that even that commander got to the point that it was causing me pain to carry it for more than four or five hours. And I switched over to uh, a 365 and I've been carrying a, um, a 365 with iron sights for, for quite some time after doing uh, some reliability testing on it here for a while uh, with the optic. Uh, I'm eventually going to, when I get one or two more things squared away with it, I'll start carrying a 365 with a, with an optic on it, you know, uh, when I'm off, but I don't think that if I just had the iron sights, that it's going to be much of a problem. You know, I can hit a season still with that gun from the draw at 50 yards with iron sights. Okay. Uh, but uh, one of the things I noticed on the course today was a little bit of speed. And I'll say that my my shots on target were much tighter. It was basically a, a rat hole chewed through the target with the with the dot over the iron sights. Um, so, again, advantages versus disadvantages doesn't mean Hackathorn's wrong. And it doesn't mean that someone else that thinks you have to have a dot is right. Um, look at where people are coming from, uh, basically. And like I said, give them, give them the respect that they're owed. And you can say, well, I do respect his accomplishments, but he was wrong. Okay. Have you ever been wrong? You know, I'm, I'm wrong at least 10 or 12 times a day. Uh, but it, if you say you respect someone's opinion, I, I'm guilty of it myself. You know, you've got to uh, you've got to actually respect it. Don't pay lip service to it. You know, and if his opinion, if he is uh, irrelevant, why is everybody so mad? If he's so yeah. irrelevant, you know, why are you so mad about what this mean old man said? You know, what, why are you so absolutely um, just up in arms about it? Why is everybody devoted all these comments and everything? Oh, he's wrong. He's wrong. Okay, good. He's wrong. Let's move on. You know, a lot of people 
uh, think that the high capacity nine millimeter is sufficient for self-defense, you know, uh, and not saying they're right, not saying they're wrong. I just told you I was carrying one, but it's because I got a bad back. Um, so uh, what was the other thing? Appendix carry, you know, uh, I carried appendix for three or four years and I got fat. Uh, so I, I don't carry appendix anymore. I don't care if someone does um, as long as they're safe with it, but I don't care if they're carrying a gun as long as they're safe around other people with it either. It doesn't matter where they're carrying it at. You know, it's again, a personal choice. Uh, it has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, Bruce Nelson, you know, he carried appendix. Jeff Cooper even wrote about him carrying appendix. Uh, a lot of the early Ipsy guys carried appendix. Um, whether someone will shoot themselves that way or not, is there more of a likelihood? Maybe, maybe not. I think that if somebody's going to shoot themselves, they're going to shoot themselves regardless. You know, where they're carrying the gun at, if they pay that little attention or if they're in such a hurry. Um, I don't know that it's faster for me. Some people it is faster for, but I was always seemed like just maybe a tenth, two tenths of a second slower because I was being so so much more conscientious of my hand position and my draw and everything else. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe you should be that conscientious of everything when you're doing it from the FBI position too. Another thing I'll tell on myself with, since this is the uh, lessons learned and humble shame uh, episode, I carried 1911 for the longest time uh, on duty. And then the agency went to Glocks and it was mandated that you carry the Glock. And I was all kinds of upset about that. Um, and I would carry the Glock on duty. As soon as I was off, I put my 1911 on, you know, and it was a, it was an emotional psychological thing. Right. And went to the range to qualify and do some training with that Glock. And I still shot very well with it, but I didn't shoot to the standard that I was used to. And it dawned on me that I had a lot higher chance of having to use that gun when I was working than I did my 1911 when I was off. So that was one of those eat crow and mm -hmm. work on it, you know, in an emotional growth type deal. Um, but it, when you look at the problem in, in that way of, okay, well, what are this person's points? Why are they saying what they're saying? If you still don't find their valid, just move on, leave it alone. Um, it's uh, it's one it's one of those we can learn, even if it's what not to do, you know. So everybody that wants to complain about Hackathorn, don't don't be like him. Go do your own thing, you know. Um, doesn't mean you're wrong. Doesn't mean he's wrong. You know, there's enough room for everybody uh, in this thing. Um, oh, let's uh, for just one second. Um, mm -hmm. let me call some more controversy. Okay, the go sub, right ahead. The sub one second draw. Yeah. Show me a video recorded incident of that happening when somebody was startled or surprised under street conditions from anything other than standing straight up. Um, again, you want to spend your time working on it, go right ahead. You know, I, no issue uh, with that whatsoever, but I think that I would probably want to get more proficient with uh, maybe target discrimination, decision making, um, how to shoot one handed, how to clear a malfunction. I think I'd want to invest that time and money on what is probable versus something that may be possible. You know, um, I had, and the reason I bring this up is the last match I shot at, the last stage, um, I had a sub one second draw from concealment and I wasn't trying for that it's just a byproduct of the wind was blowing in the right direction the sun was behind me and that just that moment in time right, right. I never cared about it 
uh, and someone said uh, said how they were impressed because they'd never seen one before. And I told them thank you, and I got to thinking about it. I knew that buzzer was going to go off. I knew what my shooting problem was. Yep. I knew that I was standing upright and I was prepped and ready. Okay, it was concealed, right? But I knew what I was about to do. And I was already, not only did I know the buzzer was going to go off to start it, but I was also given the warning of shooter ready, stand by. Okay. So I have never seen anyone react to a visual stimulus under duress from anything other than perfect condition. So we're taking all this time to practice for something that, is it going to happen? Well, if I practice this sub one second draw enough, then even if I don't do sub one second on the street, I'll be closer to it or I'll be quicker. When you're seated in your car and the guy taps on the back passenger side window, when you're in line at the restaurant and the first indication that you have that you're in a gunfight is a gun fires and the person next to you in line drops and you have to turn around and take care of that. I mean, what, what, what is the, uh, can you, if, if you can do a sub one second draw from standing, can you do it from seated? Can you do it one handed? Can you do it with a pivot? Can you do it from your back on the ground? I mean, where, where do we stop this at? We, you know, wh what are we, what are we looking at? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. You know, I've, I've done a documented 0.89 draw in that class. But as you said, I knew that the buzzer was about to sound and that there was no decision making whatsoever. It's just draw and shoot that target. Well, I'd already established our target line, et cetera. And I'm poised. I'm like that, that taut spring. And as soon as I hear the buzzer go, the start of it, I just ran the motor program. 0.89. Big deal. Now, I, I firmly believe that you know, more skill is always better. And there is a difference between a 125 draw and a 225 draw. It just flat out is. Absolutely. So the better at it you are, the better, you know, the better off you're going to be. But as we've said in previous episodes, that people are chasing, spending all of their training time and resources chasing this one little metric of the sub second draw under ideal perfect conditions where you get the shirt hemmed in the exact right place and you stand in a certain way so that the hem hangs right and your hands are in this magic cheating position. So that you just execute this motor program so you can look at the timer and go 0.99. That that to me is is irrelevant. I was shooting the other day with, with some very noted uh people. Uh, I'm not gonna toss their names out here. But okay, I was running from duty gear and I was running one six five draws. Can I do more faster than that? Absolutely. I can get faster than that. But it was appropriate for what we were doing. I had a and I I had a I had a one stage day was draw the first shot was one point five four. And I recorded it because I was looking at all the the times and stuff and I looked at it. And I thought to myself, well, I guess if I was on the street I'd be dead, you know, yeah. because that wasn't quick enough. Uh how 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 long do you need in a gunfight the rest of your life? You know. Yeah. Um, Claude Werner's done a lot, a yeah. lot of uh, research on how quick the draw has to be. But nobody wants to listen to Claude because he's practical, you know. Right. Um, right. Craig Douglas has got his version of uh, the pattern compliance pistol. And Craig's very analytical, very intelligent, put a lot of thought and stuff into it. And that's for a very specific scenario, right? Um, he's actually using a more uh, 
he's using a more well thought out of in this situation, I may need to do this, this, and this, right? So I'd rather, if I was going to do something like that, I'd rather spend time doing what Craig's talking about than working on a sub one second draw. Um, if I want a sub one second draw in that sense, then I'll probably start with my hand on my gun in my pocket, like BB's counter robbery yeah. type deal, you know, but again, that involves you seeing the trouble before it happens. And that force option gives you the ability to choose what you're going to do. So you're not behind the curve. Um, it's like, the, and it all, and the, the other thing that kills me about the sub one second thing and everybody pushes is they're presuming that that shot, that single shot is going to end the encounter, the bad stuff. And we know and that that's just, history, that's and, not right. And that's just not right. Either. Oh, I get this one sub second, you know, the sub second draw and I'm going to win and I'm going to stop it. Okay. Chances are the person that gets the first you know, hit in the important ports is probably going to win. Probably, if they have a forty-five, and with hardball, because I know that you got to have that. that they all fall inside apart. joke that we all that we do with each other, guys. Um, yeah, I, I just yeah, you know, we can go on and on and on about that, but I want to circle back, and make sure I don't forget to, to get this involved, this inserted mm -hmm. into the show. People like Cooper, people like Hackathon. People like Claude Warner, those guys have been around since the beginnings of our art. And they were about everything that, that, that Colonel Cooper taught came from the basis of testing. All of the whole modern technique came out of the stuff from the Southwest Pistol League and the, and the old letter slot matches. And it was all was a laboratory to experiment and learn. And you can't just show up on the scene. Well, you can't, but you shouldn't just show up on the scene a year or two ago and think that you've just, you're the enlightened one in all of this. And everything that came before you is wrong. We, we know this now. Uh, maybe not. And I, I got to tell you, it's just ridiculous to think that somebody like Ken Hackathor is not going out and testing what he's, what he's saying. He has a range in his backyard. Yeah. You know? Um, I'm not going to reveal uh, conversations with him because I haven't been given authority to do so. But pretty sure he's tested everything. Oh, and I'm say. pretty sure he's also still hooked in with current people yeah. that do Absolutely. things besides non combat oriented jobs. You know, so it's it's not like he just read something on the Internet and based an opinion off of that. Uh, and again, like I said, you don't you don't have to agree with Ken. I don't agree with everything everybody um, says and they don't have to agree with me, but I can look at it. And at least in America at this time, we're still free, free to choose what we want to do. So if you don't like it. Just don't do it. Move on. You know, there's 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 too much drama. All all kidding aside, you know, you and I have different gear preferences. And we needle each other about them all the time. We've done it during the, the recording of this episode. But we also still bounce stuff off of each other because we oh, respect absolutely. each other's opinion. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's the pressure test. If I can convince Shane of this argument that I want to make. Maybe there's some validity to it. If I can't convince him, I need to keep working. And, you know, same thing with Hearn and some of the other people. It's it, I want people to be around people that are going to challenge me and make me prove it, make sure I'm, make me, and make me earn it. Unless we get sure comfortable and stagnate. Right. Right. Because there may, you know what, there may be some, some John Holson walking around what, willing to show you a different way of doing things that, if you try it, it, may work better for you, you know. But if if you've got a closed head and you don't want to listen to it, then you can repeat that first year of police work twenty times instead of getting twenty years of experience. Uh, I don't want to get into all the specific details of it, but I am being because of my current employment, I'm having to delve into some fields 
that I have not previously taken deep dives in. So I'm a rookie again in certain aspects. And I was had the opportunity to train with someone who was you know, already a certified instructor in the field. They've been teaching it for a long time. And, you know, we were out doing a lesson and he used a term. And I kind of nodded my head. Mm -hmm. A little while later, he used the term again. I nodded my head. Mm -hmm. I said, hold on a second. I'm going to be a good student here rather than try to indicate that I know something that I don't really know. And I said, hey, man, you've used that term a couple of times. I think I know what it means. How about explain it to me as if you're talking to someone who has no clue about what we're talking about? Pretend I don't know anything about this and explain that term to me again. And, oh, okay. And so he goes back and explained it. And I was like, yeah, I was pretty right what he was saying, but I wasn't quite there. We've got to be able to step back and say, I'm going to be the rookie again. I'm going to be the newbie from time to time. And if we think that we've got all this stuff just down pat, what's the point in trying to train anymore? What's the point in trying to just go practice? What's the point in, in are you ever evolving? Are you ever adapting? And, you know, gear has changed. I came on the job at the end of the revolver era as agencies were making the full wholesale trans over change over to semi automatics. I still had to run a revolver. I carried an all steel traditional double action pistol for the first seven years that I was on the job. Then we went over transition to Glock and I've been striker fired ever since. I can still pull out a TDA and run it. I don't want to. Yeah, I have my first my preferences and my choices. In the last few years, like you said, you know, the whole pistol mounted optic thing has exploded. And it sits here. It's it's the thing. I still think we're a generation or two away from the mounting and the electronics to be one hundred percent full foolproof as, as any equipment can be. Yeah, but I put in that work. My pistol that I carry professionally on duty right now is a Glock. Model 45 with a direct mill from the factory acro and has a TLR7 on it because that's what I'm issued. This is, this is your equipment. Oh my gosh, I left the house today carrying a Glock 48 with iron sights and no light. Oh my goodness, guess what? I can still handle anything that I needed to handle with that 48 that I could have done with that Glock 45 and the optic, and the light. In the role that I was leaving the house. Because I was a private citizen. The only way I was going to be involved in something if somebody tried to carjack me or rob me. I wasn't going to be going to hunt in that guess. If it was all of a sudden, we're going to go hunt bad guys or whatever, okay, well then let me swap gear. <laughs> Let me swap some equipment because yeah, then I'm going to be putting on my body armor. I'm going to be putting on, you know, my radio. I'm going to be doing all that kind of stuff because that's just a different world. You know, we, we forget our context because we want to buy into the gadgets, not the mindset. It's not a gear problem. It's a mindset problem. It's a recognition problem. It's a being able to execute under unsat unideal circumstances problem that's what it is and yeah it's just funny we, we keep running in these circles over and over and over again but oh well I, I personally gonna pay attention to the guys that paid the way more so than the guy that just he worked at a gun store and so he sees a lot of people buy guns and like an uh, agency here in Georgia recently, uh, not a large agency, but not necessarily a small one either, bought duty pistols and optics for across the board, all their personnel. Mount the optics. Let's go run our first call course with them. Can't get anyone qualified running the optic. 
in order to qualify everyone so that they could actually go on duty with the guns as they all turned off the optics and qualified using the iron sights. It's like, oh, well, we'll get trained and learn how to run the optics. You know, why didn't we do all that before we went and before service with the guns? Right? I, I don't get it, but oh, they've got the latest and greatest. You know, they spent four or five hundred dollars on per officer on equipment that is completely used to them, useless to them at the moment. Kind of a hindrance at this point. But that happens. Uh, that happens a lot more than most people think, and it happens uh, mm -hmm. a lot more. We're we're tuned into the the very small, you know, one percent of the the gun owning public that is interested in this for whatever reason. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the reason is, whether it's they want to or whether they've had a situation that caused them to this point or whether they've got something that they think may doesn't matter why, but you know, they're, they're in this small community and they automatically think everyone else is like that as well. That's not how everyone else is. You know, it's, it's just not, um, law enforcement is, um, institutionally is behind, uh, the private, sector mm -hmm. you know uh so that 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 surprises some people but what you, the example you gave but it's it's more common than people know um i know we're running uh, i don't know how long we've been going but i know i know you'll have to come to an end soon i'd like to offer a um a slightly may sound opposing viewpoint to some of the stuff i've said um but as far as evolving with techniques, evolving with equipment. Uh, I've got a friend, uh, Lester, that I've talked about here before, you know, and he, I think he took his first gun sight class in 1982, 81, 82, something like that. He actually took 599, the, uh, they taught, taught 599 six times and he took it twice. Um, he trained at Thunder Ranch. He trained at a few other, when it was in Texas and a few other places. But he's been carrying the same gun, uh, 1911 Commander, uh, and the same Milt Spark Summer Two Special. Now, he's got new ones, but they're set up the same. He carried the new holsters, but same one. And he dry fires several times a week, practices once a week. And he is absolutely mesmerizing to watch because he has honed that down to a skill that few people will ever have you know um he still wants a 45 he still wants to shoot from weaver and he still wants to do certain things why would you change somebody that's that good at it you know um then you look and talk about um different things somebody somebody and i were talking early it was leo um leo hathaway and i were talking earlier about uh john farnham um met him like i said at the nti uh went through his dti instructor program don't agree with everything john says um uh, not saying that he's wrong because john absolutely is the oldest longest running firearms instructor in the country or probably world um he's got a lot of knowledge you know and he may say some things that i look at like i don't understand that or i don't agree with it but he's got a reason for it right so um one of the people that we know and uh i'm not going to get into his name or anything uh but he was a very high level um military special operations his one and only formal training class was with John Farnham. Now he was trained by uh, Pepper that invented the Pepper Popper. Uh, he was trained with military and federal special operations, but the only actual formal class he had at the beginning of his career early on was like a two day John Farnham class. And he did well for quite some time you know, with just that one class. And um, so, yes, we need to uh, 
of uh, I think I think he at last I talked to him I think he was shooting an M and P with a dot now, you know after he shot a 1911 uh, for for thirty something years and some of the worst environments that uh, you could be in. But um, you know you, you can't take someone like Lester this other guy um, that have had one or a handful of classes and and practice something over and over and over and say, well, if you don't switch to a nine millimeter with a red dot, or if you don't switch to this, why they're outperforming 90% of everybody else anyway, doing the same old thing, you know? So to, to not saying that you have to do it that way, not saying you have to do it the other way, but go back to what you and I have, have kind of, um, danced around what you've come out and said and what I've, I've said uh, for one or two different topics uh, tonight is that of seeing what's going to happen before it happens so that you can either avoid it or mentally prepare for it is more important than just about anything else. You get, you get a quality gun, you get quality support gear, and you get the proper, correct quality training and you practice it every now and then, you're way ahead of everybody, you know? And I think that that and getting along with each other is a lot more important than being triggered at a emotional, almost Antifa level over some guy that has done more than you ever will in two lifetimes say that you don't need a red dot, you know, but what, what do I know? Yeah. Yeah. It's. And I'm going to add into this, all the technical skill in the world doesn't matter if you can't explain, if you can't articulate why you used it, if you have to use it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I've had the opportunity to run some judgmental pistol shooting laboratories here recently. And what I'm seeing is people are making correct, justified use of force decisions. But when you start questioning them on it afterwards, they fall completely apart. And just can't explain why they did what they did. They say, I'm in, I was in fear for my life or worse yet, ability, opportunity and jeopardy. Uh, you know, but they, I know I'm joking yeah. with them, but they, they can't tell yeah. you why they did what they did. Well, why'd you shoot him three times? It's a simple question. You're not trying to him a lot, right. but he was still in a position or actively trying to kill me by doing this. So right. I continued to shoot him while he was pointing his gun at me until he quit pointing his gun at me. Right. Uh, and these are people who have had a legal education on the topic, and when I say that, they've been taught the laws that apply. And when you start asking, okay, what law govern your actions there? And they can't explain it. That pesky little Title 16 or 17? Yeah, well, both of them come into play. But six, if it's a 16 question, they start trying to give me the 17 answer. Like if, if your mother was standing here in the same capacity, you know, in this same situation and that happened was she been justified in using deadly force well yeah well then why are you giving me the 17 answer when the 16 answer applies so for those that aren't aware 16 code in georgia is the code that would cover everyone 17 would cover specifically for cops when we're talking about the use of deadly force and for the cop part of that equation only covers us in a very specific set of circumstances otherwise we're covering them with 16 321 just like everybody else is and but you got to be able to explain that you got to be able to articulate it and it does not matter if you have all the technical skill if you don't have the decision making ability and you don't have the ability to explain why you did it if you had to do it and better yet how about let's avoid the whole thing if we can completely avoid it and then you don't have to worry about it to start with and then it doesn't matter if you have a red dot or not Right. The only way to win is to not play. Or, you know, to borrow a line from that old eighties movie. And it's just just we want to focus on a lot of the wrong things, I think. Um 
think it. I spent a lot of time and effort and resources to basically master the pistol man enough to. There are th- I've now crossed a point skill threshold wise that I am capable of doing things with a dot that I was not capable of doing things with an iron sight. But those are a very limited set of skills. Knowing all that, I still left the house today carrying about 48. Oh, absolutely. With iron sights. With iron sights. And you were you were no less prepared to deal with whatever came your way in your capacity right. and your um Pat Rogers, the mission drives the gear uh loosely yeah. paraphrased you know so if uh yeah and we both said hey you know in these circumstances we do better with a dot but if somebody handed either one of us uh, mm-hmm. glock 19 with factory sights on it and we had a chance to make sure the thing was reliable I don't think we'd hesitate to go do our job, you know, and be worried. There's so many other things to worry about than there are that. But, you know, somebody's got the choice. Somebody's got the ability. They want to. As long as they have a true understanding and skill and command of that piece of equipment, okay, go ahead. You know, um, if you feel better with it, as long as you can perform, go do it. Um, uh, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that you absolutely and I've fallen into that category myself back in that time frame, like I told you <clears throat> from that intensive pistol skills class. If I didn't have this, 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 if I didn't have the right 1911 made by the right custom maker with the mm-hmm. right ammo, with the right lubricant, with the right holster, then oh dear lord, something's gonna happen. You know, I have to have no, you don't. You, you don't, as long as you've got the ability and skills to see what's going on, avoid it if you can, and you've got some that's reliable that you can you can hit with and control, then, then what does it really matter? You might feel better with something else, but doesn't mean that you have to have it to survive. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Glock guy. When I can't get a hold to my CZ that I really prefer. But, you know, I'm a Glock guy. If all of a sudden my agency called us in all in next week and said we were going to MMP duty pistols, okay. I can do what I need to do with MMP. I might drop a point or two here or there, occasionally on a qualification course that I wouldn't have dropped with a Glock, but okay. And then I'm, you'll I'll take that and go out and fine. train with it. And you'll right. get up to a skill level that surpassed what you did when you were first issued. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just, I have my preferences. And yeah, if, if I'm given carte blanche, go pick whatever you want, and that's what you get to use, then I have my preferences of what I'm going to use. But I can make do with whatever I've got to make do with. Yeah, I can make it work because I'm trained. I'm capable. It's a mindset thing. It's not a gear thing. You need me to go run three miles. I haven't put in work to do that. Not since I was 15, 16 years old running a long distance in high school. So I would suffer there. Maybe I'd be better off doing that than I am doing some of the good stuff, though. Look at uh, we, you know, we've had this conversation. I went on, I went down the rabbit hole trying to find it, but look at the combat triad. The mm-hmm. base of the triad is mindset, yep. you know, and um, someone else that I didn't agree with everything on, um, and may rest in peace, uh, James Yeager, very controversial person. James would give you the shirt off his back. You know, if you were homeless, he would bring you in and feed you. You know, um, he had he had an Internet persona that was different from from who he was in, in actuality, you know. Um, but 
for everything I disagree with. And there were many things I disagree with James on. Um, but when he started talking about the, he didn't call it a pyramid. He had his own version, but mm -hmm. mindset was the basis of everything else, you know, and he'd tell you the root, um, the root word of gunfight was not gun. It was fight, you know, and for years, he was very dogmatic about it. Had to be a Glock 19 with big dot sights and uh, did did all this other stuff. He eventually tried different guns. You know, he and he and Andy went out to gun sight with 1911s. You know, he, he tried a SIG. I don't know. I didn't keep up with him that much, but I'd see things here and there that he would change them. And again, I, this is someone that I completely disagree with on the majority of things, but he was a good person. And he also had it figured out about what was most important when we were dealing with a martial skill set. You know, uh, the final weapon is the brain. Uh, if, if you look at most of them uh, that are top tier instructors, uh, Tom places emphasis on mindset and seeing what's going on before it happens to avoid it. You know, uh, Insights was very big on that. Um, there And there's so many others, but if you look at all of these people that have been very successful, that have a lot of knowledge and that kind of have it figured out, they put more of an emphasis on the mental skill set and seeing what's coming and trying to avoid them if you can't then having your mind correct so you can engage and deal with it as needed. Um, so, but that, you know, that's, that's another example that just came to my mind of someone that I don't agree with, but um, on a lot of things, but I respect what he was doing and I take and look and say, okay, he had his reason for it and that's fine. I'm not going to do that, but he can, and also look and find his contributions, you know, and that one of those contributions was uh, instilling in a, a portion of the gun community that uh, would probably not go take training anywhere else or, or maybe not even take another class. At least he instilled, even if it was a, a grain of salt into their mind about mindset. And about thinking of things, you know, um, Andy, Andy and I don't agree on a lot of things, but Andy's biggest thing was avoiding the situation altogether. You know, uh, I think his, his tagline was a lifelong commitment to, um, personal situational awareness or something, and I'm slaughtering it. Um, but he wanted to avoid the thing altogether. You know, Tom Gibbons wants you to see it and get away from it or be prepared to deal with it. Um, so uh, John Farnham, don't go stupid places with stupid people and do stupid things. Everybody's got their own version of it, but uh, it's, it's the most important. And it's what we put the very least amount of effort into because it's not fun and it's not cool. And you can't put mindset on the ground. And people don't want to go take a class from an instructor that has avoided 300 shootings when they can go take one from somebody that's been in two, you know? Um, and it doesn't mean the guy that, uh, that has never been in a gunfight or a shooting can't teach you anything. You'd be surprised what he can teach you, even about shooting and gunfighting. Um, so, yeah, uh, I've had three of my students that have been involved in deadly force encounters in which they actually had to use deadly force that I'm aware of. All three were successful, all three won their encounters. I have a fourth student who contacted me and said he was able to avoid having to use force because he recognized the situation based on something that I had taught him in class. 
and he recognized it and he got out of it. And then he's to me that's a bigger win than the other three. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, that, that that's huge. Huge. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back of it, but when I think about, oh, I've got three that have, yeah, you know, well, I got this other guy that there's no stat. Uh, back when I was a shift sergeant and you know, I'd be there at shift change. My guys were coming in. We were flopping out to the next shift. And, you know, I'd ask, what'd you do today? And cops that hadn't caught anything or whatever, you know, hadn't caught the bad guy that shift or whatever. Man, I didn't get in anything. They didn't happen. I said, that's not the right answer. You patrolled effectively and you, and you prevented crime. That's what you answered me with that question. With when I, when you said, so, so how do we have a, where's the stat for crimes permitted on, I mean, crime prevented on our stat sheet there's not because you don't know what the mere presence and every and that's just like right. you don't know how many students you have had or right. jeff cooper or tom gibbons or uh whoever you don't know how many students you've had that are alive because they saw the problem and said not today you know exit stage right, right. and because they don't call you and tell you about it you know right. Um, uh, but you, you never know how many people were able to see that problem, have confidence in their ability that you gave them. Number one, they have the ability to see the problem that you taught them. Number two, they have confidence in their ability to face the problem if it continues to be a problem, but they choose to get out because they had that availability. Now, they might not always have a, a chance to get out and, or they may not be able to retreat, but we don't know how many people, you know, have been trained that just avoided the situation and won. So uh, the, you, you've probably got a, a good bit, many more than that, you know, and it could just be somebody that took that class one time. And what they got out of it was, oh, he told me that if I see trouble, the best thing to do is leave. And that's the only thing they got out of the class, but they're alive because of it. Uh, we've been going about an hour and a half now, so I should really try and pre-wrap this up. Uh, any closing thoughts, anything coming up class-wise anybody would like to know about? Um, touch with you? Class-wise, no. I don't want anybody to get in touch with me. Uh and uh, the only the closing thought, and I may have said it before, but it, it can never be said enough. Um, I truly believe in my heart that John Hearn is a good shooter and firearms instructor. He's not great like Lee Weems, but he's okay. <laughs> well, there you go. That was worth having you on for just, just right there. Thank you, right sir. There. All right, well, folks, I am. Um, two and a half pages away on a paper to finish up the next to the last class in the graduate program again and then it's another uh, one final class over the next eight weeks so I should be done sometime I think it's May 3rd or something like that when everything's due uh, for that that class I'll have to look at the calendar once I get started and see what the due dates are but we're close we're close to the light to the end of the tunnel um Unfortunately, I contacted one of the local ranges where I like to teach about what was available in mid to late May. And the only thing that are available are Mother Day's weekend, Mother's Day weekend and Memorial Day weekend and classes on holiday weekends don't go. So I'm not sure when I will be back out with some with some classes, but they'll be coming. Just watch watch the webpage. They'll be out. Uh, and with that, uh, we know that your most important asset is your time. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us and only share the link to the show with your smart friends.